Um, I'm Reverend Sadiqi Little Forbes. Um, I'm the minister at Emmanuel United Church in Windsor. Um, for those who don't know where Windsor is, we, we are the border city for Detroit, Michigan. Um, Emmanuel United has Methodist roots. We will celebrate 100 years um, in June next year. So we're getting ready, ramping up our anniversary plans. Um, the oldest part of this building um, was actually opened on the 10th of June. That's the day of union. Hmm. So we also share um, that history. Um, the sanctuary can sit 300 comfortably on the first floor and then another 50 or 60 in the balcony. Um, the church has two halls um, with small kitchenettes and meeting rooms attached to them. And then it has a banquet hall with a commercial sized kitchen. Um, a, average attendance on a Sunday is 85. And we have a, that, that's adult. Um, we have a Sunday school of 25. Um, and we get four or five visitors per month. So we have a nice steady flow um, of visitors. And it is a very growing congregation. We have an excellent choir excellent choir director. We have a liturgical frame for worship and free coffee and cookies and conversation after church. <laughs> so that is pretty much um, uh, the, 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 the context. Um, when I decided to push the congregation a bit to, to, to reach out to the community, um, as it always happens in every context I've ever served, I celebrate 12 years of ordination in November. So I've been doing this for a while and two things happen. First, they start to ask, what about us? Um, yeah, there are all kinds of things happening out there in the community, but we need to take care of our own first. Um, so I do three things. To me, that is a response to a need that they think needs to be filled before we go out. And so what I did was to do a simultaneous in-reach outreach. So I'm going to talk about the in-reach piece. Um, so I, I, I isolated it to three things. One is the need for connection. Um, so the first thing that I implemented when I came was uh, this greeting time at the beginning of the service. It's a welcome time. Um, and, and you will find I am inspired by scripture. So everything that I do is driven by something I read in scripture at some point. So this is a second Corinthians um, inspiration about greet one another with a sacred kiss, right? And they do do quite a bit of that too when they're, but, it, but what it has happened is it, it really is very helpful for the visitors as we have heard from feedback. And it also kind of get the congregation in a loving, open frame of mind. So I will say something, a statement that they have to exchange that is funny and is connected to the sermon, right? So I will say, turn to your neighbor and tell them, hey, we're on top of the ground, right? Um, and that usually they erupt in laughter and everyone moves around and then we pull back together. It's very, very easy. The other thing that I do in the service is to celebrate significant life events. And that is, in our case, birthday and anniversaries. And people sign up for that. Um, and they put their month, month of birth and their month of marriage if they want to celebrate it. And then on the first Sunday of the month, I do the birthday song and we sing Bind Us Together and I do a special blessing um, with olive oil. Um, and in that blessing, that is inspired. You know this story, or I hope you know the story of Job when he was really going through a difficult time and he cursed the day that he was born. And he spent five or eight verses talking about he should not have been born and he cursed the day and and you know, he hopes sun never shines on the day. And he went into quite a bit of detail about that. So when I bless people on their birthday, I do the reverse of that, which is I say to them, I bless the day that you were born, or I bless the day of your marriage. And for born, I say, I bless the day that you were born. It was a good day. And the world is better for having you in it. And it's very, I, I 
didn't conceive it as having the impact that it has. But for a lot of people, that is something that they have never heard or need to hear. So it has turned out to be a very powerful spiritual experience in the service. And people walk up to the front for me to do it. And the children are usually at the front at that time. So if it's their birthday, they'll get up and get their blessing. And now people, if they miss the month they were supposed to get blessing, then the next month they come and say, I missed my blessing. So <laughs> they come for that. And, and I, we found it inclusive because if you're not married, you still get a birthday blessing and so on. So that has, in, in, in my mind, begun to ease this sentiment that they're not being cared for. So why are you going to fuss over um, other people outside? The other thing that I do is I recognize that people need something to be convicted about and something to be committed to. So, and I do that through the sermon. So what I do is what I call a teaching sermon, which is a little bit more detail than the cursory point method, 15 or 20 minutes. And it's kind of like, you know where you're fighting for to get people to come to Bible study on another day? Well, I get a captive audience of 85 people for Bible study on a Sunday morning. And the spin-off of that is they feel that I am diligently ensuring that they are fed. So that's the other need. And then the last thing that um, I do in relation to that, which has worked out very well, is to get people involved in the worship experience. And I do that through liturgical dance. So there are a group of children who um, participate in that and they're all ballet crews and all kinds of um, things. And, the, and then I have people who read scripture and that incorporates quite a wide cross section of, of the congregation. And then we introduce the family Advent candle lighting, which is every Christmas we have families like the Advent candle, but we're very deliberate about making the family not like the traditional nuclear family. And, and we have a very diverse and inclusive congregation, even though we're not an affirming church in the, you know, formal sense. So, you know, we have um, male couples with children and we have female couples with children and grandparents and whatever the couple combination is, we try to make sure there's one represented. So that has pulled everyone together. And then we have added some additional outreach activities that we encourage people to participate in. So the downtown mission, Ronald McDonald House, we do some work with Children's Aid um, and, and the m and Fund and that kind of thing. And there, if there's any community event that needs funding, we usually pull those in. So pretty much that combination has really quelled the anxiety around, you're gonna go outside and focus on those people out there and we don't get covered. Um, I also have a very strong pastoral care approach. So, my visitation is on fleek and <laughs> and i have ways of connecting with people that have proven to be very very effective and from that just that section the congregation has grown and grown significantly um in the four years that i've been here um the other part yeah. is the other question that people ask after they ask what about us they're not the ones who ask it is the people on the outside that ask how about us because what I learned, and I don't know if this is a Windsor thing or, or what, um, but I remember saying to someone, you know, if they wanted space to use, a church has tons of space. And the response was, I thought you had to be a part of the church to use the facilities. And I said, no, you actually don't. But traditionally in this space, which actually has a very strong Catholic background, that was the case. You had to be a Catholic to use the church space. So I think that culture is there. So what I sought to do um, are two things. One is what I call a community invitation, and two is the community hub. The community invitation, um, inspired by the story of the great dinner in Luke 14, um, is 
you know, if you live in a growing community like Windsor is, the community changes every couple of months because people move in and people move out. So the idea was to reintroduce ourselves to the, to the community around the church. And that was simply making a five by seven index card, which is the thing I sent you call it, that carries the congregational events for the Christmas season and then a graphical representation of the church's activities um, on the other side. And for $1,400, which includes printing and paying Canada Post, we are able to send out 5,000 of those cards in the mail to 5,000 households with around the community. And we only do it at season. So right now we only do it at Christmas, but the plan is to also do it in the Easter season. And what that has done is whenever we have Christmas Eve services, we have over 200 people attending. Can you see that right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that is the back of the, um, the, 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 the card we send out and it, kind of like gives a summary of what one hour can do if you come to Emmanuel. Um, and if you're outreachy, the outreach stuff was on one side. And if you're into worship or Sunday school or whatever, then it's, it's all captured there. Um, so we've been doing that for a couple of years and that has influenced the new people who have come through and they like it and then they come back. The front carries the, the events for December. So we also get a boost of income in community people coming to the fundraising events, as well as coming to the worship services. Um, the teddy bear service has been really fantastic. It is the first service on Christmas Eve. It's for the babies. And we don't have less than 20 people um, at the teddy bear service. I just tell a Christmas story and give the kids cupcake. And what the parents who have a party to go to, on Christmas Eve, but they want to do church too, they bring them to that and then go to their party. So that is a need that we've actually um, satisfied. And then the last thing um, we thought, I thought this entire building is such a waste. Peter has seen it, um, that it is a fantastic building with wonderful facilities. And so I thought we need to figure out how to get people to use this. And so with talking to Carla, talking to Peter, um, we set up Emmanuel as a community hub. And so what happens now is people can have access to renting the space um, at what I call the church price. And what the congregation hasn't thought about was renting the kitchen. And renting the kitchen has been the best thing that has happened here in terms of an idea where the church can, one, reach out to the community, and two, to raise extra cash. It's not tons of cash, but you'd be amazed what $50 more does over time. So we have been renting our commercial kitchen. Um, we only can rent to people who bake, but we keep it only for startups. So we are offering that ministry to people who are just starting out on their business and they can't afford a big office or a big space to hold a meeting and and so that has um, that has done very well. It, it's not doing as well as I would hope because there is a, a stigma associated with coming into church. Um, but um, through personal contact with different people, I've managed to get um, some amount of activity um, going. So those would be the innovations that have helped us grow significantly financially the congregation is also doing well um and so we we can't complain two challenges one insurance um our trustees require that everyone who uses the building has insurance and that can be very expensive for even startups so we are trying to work out a way to deal with that particular obstacle um, and, and, and that has been a challenge. We had tried to work with an entity, another startup um, called Boost, and what they were going to do was recruit 
um, people who wanted to use the space in general, and then they would get a blanket in a bigger insurance that their, their clients could then, through them, access the church's space. Um, it did prove very expensive for them, so they haven't actually started to, to use the space um, because of that. But because we had already started to promote the church as being accessible, we still get people using the space, but they have to get their own um, insurance. And then if you have any ideas about my second challenge, which is to get the church to spend money when they have it. And that, in, 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 in this case, it's not a case that the money doesn't exist. The money is there, but they are very reluctant to spend it. Thank you. That's it.